Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see um, those of you here um, in person and um, everybody online. We can't see folks online, but we know they're there. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. Um, we're so very fortunate to have an extraordinary panel of individuals with us um, today um, for what will promise, uh, we, uh, which will promise to be a very, very powerful discussion. I think we'd all agree. Um, I'm grateful to have their voices and their perspectives on such an urgent issue that's before us. So we are now living in the post Roe America. Nine months have passed since the Supreme Court ruled in Dobbs versus Mississippi, revoking the long recognized constitutional right to an abortion. While many of us have, had, have been preparing uh, for this possibility, we were still shattered uh, by the decision and gravely concerned about what would happen next. Public health research has consistently shown us that the impact, uh, what, the impact of abortion restrictions, they are linked to higher uh, maternal mortality, lower birth weights, lasting financial hardship for individuals and for families. What's more, we know abortion restrictions exacerbate our country's already formidable health disparities that are caused by systemic racism. Since last June, we have watched the devastating impact of the Dobbs decision unfolding. There are now 24 states that have banned abortion or are likely to do so. And soon we may see that the FDA may overturn, the, an overturn of the FDA's approval um, of the medication mifepristone, um, which would be yet another terrible attack on uh, abortion care in America. All of this is having a significant effect on safe pregnancy and challenges disrupting the doctor's ability to provide their patients with a full measure of reproductive care. Now this news, as we know, can be very overwhelming to all of us. But we must remember that there are reasons for some optimism. Since Roe was struck down, we have seen voters in Kansas, Kentucky, and Michigan, and other states come out strongly in favor of protecting access to reproductive health. We are not alone in our work to support abor abortion care. And I always find hope in the public health community where so many people remain staunchly committed to supporting sexual and reproductive health. Right here at the Bloomberg School, we have colleagues working to advance all aspects, including abortion. Since the Dobbs ruling, our efforts in research, advocacy, policy, and communication have continued to protect health and save lives. Among those doing some of this work are the faculty, staff, and students of our, our uh, school Center for Public Health and Human Rights, which of course is the uh, sponsor for today's event. This center is at the forefront of research, teaching, and advocacy to support some of the world's most vulnerable people in asserting their rights to health, human dignity, and autonomy. This includes protecting reproductive rights. Center faculty uh, member Cherie Schwartz is with us today, and she'll be uh, leading today's discussion. And we are thrilled to be joined by two very distinguished guests, Dr. Rebecca, Rebecca Gumper, Gumpertz, and Emily Baz Bazelon, as well as our um, exceptional PhD student, uh, Sarah uh, Daniel. You will hear more from them in just a few minutes. But I just want to say how excited I am to be here and to, be, and to have a chance, really, to learn from the experience and expertise of these um, uh, incredibly accomplished women and to discuss this challenge we have in, uh, in front of us. We may be living in a post-Roe America, but we still believe that everyone deserves full and complete access to reproductive health care. We still believe that everyone deserves the right to con control the most fundamental aspects of their lives. In the wake of losing Roe, we will work even harder than ever before in service of those beliefs. We will gather our champions, like the ones we have here today, both our panelists and those of you here in the room and on the Zoom, to continue sharing the evidence, advocating for care, and fighting for change. 
Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the Center for Public Health and Human Rights for providing a forum to lift up the importance of reproductive health rights. And thank you all for being uh, here with us today. We, together, we will give this topic uh, the attention it certainly deserves. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Len Rubenstein, uh, Professor of the Practice and uh, Interim Director of the Center for Public Health and Human Rights. And may I take this opportunity, actually, Len, to thank you for um, being um, a leader for the Center for Public Health and Human Rights during this uh, time of transition. Thank you. I'd like to welcome you all as well to this important discussion. And Dean McKenzie, uh, I want to thank you not only for your being here with us today, but your steadfast, steadfast support for human rights and making human rights part of the key, a key to the mission of uh, public health. And that is not something everyone in the uh, public health community does, but you do, and we're grateful for that. And we also are grateful that you speak out on key human rights issues that many other deans find too political. You recognize that part of the mission of public health is to speak out on, on those issues, and we appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to introduce the speakers, but I just want to tell you a bit about the Center for Public Health and Human Rights for those who don't know. We do basically two things. We illuminate the ways in which human rights violations, exclusion, discrimination, criminalization of populations, marginalization, drive ill health. And we try to do something to end those violations. And then we apply, employ human rights as a tool to design public health programs that respect human dignity. That's what we do. And we work in areas as varied as gender-based violence, punitive drug and immigration policies, transgender health, uh, attacks on healthcare and conflict, uh, denial of uh, HIV prevention and treatment services to people who are very marginalized in society. And we link that to advocacy to, based on that research. Today's subject, of course, falls squarely within our concern and we're very fortunate to have an amazing group of people to discuss these with, with us. Uh, the discussion will be led by Sharif Schwartz, uh, who is faculty in the uh, Center and the Department of Epidemiology and is also co-director of the Impl Implementation Science Core of the Center for AIDS Research here. Uh, Shuri's career has focused on optimizing sexual and reproductive health in the United States and globally. Her work in South Africa is particularly noteworthy uh, because along with coalition partners, she has advanced reproductive health services, particularly for people with HIV and particularly among them for the most marginalized communities. It's really important work and it makes a huge impact. She will be joined by three extraordinary people. First, you see on the screen, Dr. Rebecca Gompert, the Dutch physician who's with us from Amsterdam by Zoom. Uh, more than 20 years ago, it was 1999, uh, she founded an organization, Women on Waves, to make abortion accessible to places where it was prohibited and often criminalized. She managed to figure out how to uh, provide abortion services from ships, robots, drones, apps, and hotlines. And that actually started changing the world. She became world famous both for her innovative and creative approaches to making abortion accessible but for fighting off all the legal and political obstacles to doing so. And in so doing, she pioneered the work in telemedicine uh, and gained new suppliers for abortion medication. She didn't stop there. 2005, Dr. Gompert expanded her work on abortion beyond women 
and Waves, and founded Women on Web, which is a way of expanding telemedicine. And included in that work, in a, starting in 2018, was to recognize that even though abortion was still legal in the United States, the restrictions on access were getting ever more draconian. So she started working here through telemedicine. Then after Dobbs, she expanded further and to make abortion accessible in states where it is prohibited. She's received many, many awards for her work, appeared on multiple lists as among the most influential thinkers in the world. Now, back in 2014, Dr. way long ago, <laughs> Dr. Gompertz was profiled by another participant today, Emily Bazelon. Emily is a journalist uh, for the New York Times Magazine, author of two best-selling books, one on the culture of bullying and another on how our criminal justice system advances mass incarceration. She's also co-host of an illuminating and wildly popular podcast, A Slate Political Gap Fest, which I highly recommend, and she's a lecturer at Yale Law School. With her deep knowledge on the politics of, the, of abortion, Emily has written about the impact of Dobbs and new efforts to protect reproductive rights in its wake. In another article in the Times Magazine, uh, almost a decade after she first profiled Dr. Gompert, she wrote about how Don, Dr. Gompert, along with many American physicians taking great personal and legal risks, are finding ways to protect, protect, protect excuse me, reproductive rights. Uh, finally, and hardly least today, we'll be joined by Sarah Daniel, a third year PhD student in epidemiology and a birth equity scholar at the National Birth Equity Collaborative. Before coming here, she worked to advance abortion and contraceptive access in many ways through telemedicine, medication abortion, challenges to restrictions on minors seeking abortion, and punitive regulations on abortion facilities. All that work and much more on racial disparities in, in reproductive health. Sarah co-authored, one of the few PhD students here to do that, uh, a commentary in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was on the subject of advancing birth equity in post Dobbs United in the post Dobbs United States. It was about in part how <clears throat> black families are disproportionately harmed by abortion restrictions and urged what could be done. So this is an amazing group of people and it will be a discussion today but which will lead will lead off with a little presentation by Sheree Schwartz and then uh, the other panelists will come up and we'll have a discussion. So Shri, why don't you come up? Thanks, Len, and, and thanks to the Dean. Thanks so much to the panelists for being here. Um, it's a sobering discussion, but it's one that I'm really honored to get to, to share with you today. I'll also just thank uh, Anna and, and Nicole for all of your work coordinating. I'm not going to take long, I promise, but this is our annual event for the Center of Public Health and, and Human Rights. So we wanna take this, this opportunity briefly to highlight some of the work of our faculty and, and students in the reproductive autonomy space. And I promise to be quick. Um, so we recognize human rights to be inherent to us. These rights include the most fundamental of them, uh, such as the right to life, but also other important aspects, such as the right um, to food, education, work, healthcare, which we work so um, much around, and liberty. The reproductive justice framework emphasizes that individuals' human rights um, include the right to have a child, the right to not have a child, and the right to parent the children one has in safe and sustainable communities. And I have a feeling you'll probably be hearing a little bit more about this framework today. 
But critical in to unpacking this framework is the rec recognition of intersectionality. So including histories of racism and oppression, gender inequity, social class and sexuality. Examples of the work um, of work in the space of reproductive justice or highlighting reproductive autonomy from the school are many. So I'm only gonna highlight a few today. Um, first I'll note uh, Sarah Daniel's work, which has already been uh, mentioned by Len, uh, the importance of advancing birth equity in the US and, and happily we'll be hearing more from her today. Work within our key populations program at the center, which focuses on marginalized populations affected by HIV, has frequently elevated the importance of reproductive autonomy. Kate Ruchinsky, faculty within our center, and Carrie Lyons, a PhD student, though not that much longer, has utilized the People Living with HIV Stigma Index 2.0, this is a cross-country survey, to highlight some of these issues globally. They found that one in 10 women living with HIV has experienced forced sterilization, contraception, or coercive actions related to their pregnancies. A key finding from this work, though sadly not very surprising, is that women who are the most marginalized, those who have migrated, sex workers, women who inject drugs, are two times more likely to have experienced these coercive practices, whether it's forced family planning, coerced sterilization, or, or co coercion related to pregnancy and breastfeeding practices, Further, among the women experiencing reproductive coercion, they're half as likely to experience successful treatment for their HIV, even when services are, are available to them. And the clear theme of these findings is similar to work that Steph Burrell and, and uh, myself and other team members have been highlighting for several years now, in which this panel will explore in different ways. But it's essentially that those most marginalized tend to be most negatively impacted by the threats to reproductive health and to be populations for which the least research is available. We have seen some wins over the years though, so I don't want this to all be negative, um, in including work that I co-led to advance reproductive guidance for individuals and couples affected by HIV, an area that there is quite a bit of broad consensus now that people living with HIV should be able to choose what their family formation looks like. But when um, I was first engaging in this work about 15 years ago, that consensus did not exist. So we'll take that as one public health win. And, and finally, to prove that I'm a true academic, I'm gonna put up one last framework here um, to help position our conversation today. So implementation science is transdisciplinary field. It's one increasingly used uh, in the work of many of our center faculty, which seeks to advance the uptake of evidence-based interventions in real world settings. So this is an example of the con consolidated framework for implementation research, which I've applied to the intervention of abortion. The utility of the frameworks like these, I'd argue, is to help organize our thinking around some of the issues, recognizing that interventions like abortion care have their own characteristics, how effective and safe they are, how much they cost, how complex they are to deliver, how adaptable they are if one of the drugs, for example, is taken off the market, the advantages or disadvantages compared to other reproductive options. But the framework highlights that the intervention and, and access to that, the implementation of it, interacts with the multi-layered system in which characteristics of service providers and patients will influence delivery and are embedded within an inner setting in which factors related to the organizations and climates within which healthcare providers work in, as well as outer setting features, particularly critical in this case. Critical events like the overturning of OV Wade, Roe v. Wade, laws criminalizing abortion, external pressure, including media, demonstrations, elections, local attitudes influenced by things like religion and politics, and local conditions, poverty, structural racism, gender inequity. And together, this is a system that the intervention is carried out under and which must be understood in its totality in order for us to act. Our panel today really highlights this diverse set of views. We bring together uh, expertise in actually provision of care uh, with Dr. Gompertz, uh, expertise legally and in terms of media communication with Emily Bazelon, and expertise in terms of mobilizing communities and, and leading research in this space with Sarah Daniel. So I'll invite our panelists up, please. Um, so 
So given this diverse set of um, expertise, I would like to start out and ask each of you if you could just provide a brief overview from your particular perspectives of where we currently are at in terms of the status of reproductive health in the United States. Dr. Humphreys, maybe we'll start with you. Well, I think you're muted. Sorry. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. I would have loved to be there, uh, I hope, next time. Um, it's been an interesting journey for me in the last five years to see how access to abortion ha has become restricted. Um, of course, uh, before DOPS, there, we already knew from research, we published research, uh, that there were already a lot of obstacles to uh, abortion care, uh, especially financial and uh, distance-wise. And that is because most of the clinics, they charged uh, around 600 euros or dollars for an abortion. Um, and with the poverty rate uh, uh, in the US, that's a lot of money for a large group of the population. Um, and so um, that is why I, uh, I started Aid Access. Uh, all, and, and, uh, and, and together with Aid Access, we immediately started doing the research together with uh, Texas University to understand what is happening around access uh, to abortion. Um, the moment that the ban came into place, for example, when Texas uh, banned abortion in September, 2020, um, we immediately saw an enormous peak in uh, in, in requests, um, and uh, we that that has increased after DOPS. Um, and what we've learned from the data is that it's again mostly minorities, uh, people living in poor areas um, that cannot afford to travel or can afford the the normal services. And I think if there's a silver lining to what has happened before adopts, but with COVID, uh, when telemedical abortions became allowed by the federal drug agencies, um, is that uh, the, the cost for abortion has declined a lot. Aid Access is asking uh, from the US providers $150 or between $100 and $150, let's say. And it has a sliding scale and people that cannot afford can get it for free. Uh, and that is so much less than the, the $600. So it has, on the one hand, it has increased access for a large group of people. Telemedicine has, um, and uh, and DOPS has made telemedicine even more urgent. I think the problem now, really, and I, I will be brief, is that what we know is some of the states are moving towards um, shield law states, so states where they will protect providers in uh, abortion services to the women um, in the states uh, where abortion is banned. Uh, but it's not going fast enough. There's only one state now that allowed, that has included the shield law. Um, so protecting providers and women against the criminalization of abortion in the other states, and it's Massachusetts. New York is stalling, um, and uh, and we don't know. I think it's the problem is that the abortion providers, abortion rights movement, it, they don't just they don't, don't get really together. I think there's still a lot of opposition against self-managed abortion, which means women taking abortion pills themselves, which is extremely safe, which has been supported by the World Health Organization. And I, I really, I, I think that is where the, really the opportunity is in the US uh, to make sure that there is, um, that there is a continuous access to abortion is to implement these shield law states, uh, shield laws in all the different states. Um, and, and of course, I mean, I'm also watching closely the decision of Texas uh, concerning Mifepiston. Um, but, you know, I think what is, that is the difference with, you know, before Roe versus Wade and now. Abortion pills are available. It's not going to be stopped. And it's going to be, people are going to import it. But it's like with everything that's illegal, which you see with drugs, it's the, the people, minorities and poor people that will be criminalized and will face the consequences. And it's the people with means, and and so in, in the end, it will just cause social injustice. Yep. Emily, will you add to that? Sure. Um, so I think there are two big forces that are completely transforming reproductive care and justice and rights at the moment. One is the law which in the United States, as you all know, has dramatically changed and has become a much greater obstacle. And 
um, how much the law is an obstacle depends where you live now in the United States. We had a constitutional right to abortion. Now those rights are up to the states. Um, it wasn't as if there was equal access before Dobbs because uh, there were states that had imposed restrictions and there were increasing travel distances to clinics, which, again, this is a theme that I'm sure all of you can guess affects uh, low income and um, women of color more than other people. Um, but there was a national constitutional right, and now that's gone. On the other hand, there is this technological transformation that Rebecca's work has really pioneered and spread around the globe, and those are abortion pills. Um, before Roe versus Wade, that option didn't exist, and it makes an enormous difference in terms of actual access. And so what I see coming, and really that's already begun, is a fight between the states over actually getting pills into the hands of people who need and want them. So Rebecca was talking about shield laws in states that would protect providers who provide pills across state lines through telemedicine. The, those bills can't completely shield those providers legally, but they can go a long way to reassuring people that they're not going to be arrested or sued in Texas for something that they do while they're physically in Massachusetts and New York. And a lot of the providers who work with Rebecca are working hard to try to get that kind of shield because they think it will really help change the picture for providing access across the country. At the same time, red states that don't want access to abortion, right? The whole idea was to stop that. That's why they have these laws. They are fighting back. And so right now, um, this whole looming question about Mifepristone is in the courts. And there is a big lawsuit that um, a bunch of attorneys general and other plaintiffs have brought that is trying to uh, force the FDA to withdraw its approval of Mifepristone. That approval dates from the year 2000. This is a drug that's been legal in the United States for a long time. It would be unheard of, according to people who study this, for a court to just summarily order the FDA to reverse the decisions it's made in the past, especially because mifepristone has a very high profile for safety and for effectiveness. Um, you, some of you may already know this, MIFI is one of two drugs that are used to provide abortions. And one of the big questions, if indeed this court, um, this judge orders a nationwide injunction, will be whether people can have, how, how, how much will um, abortion pills become a single pill, mesoprostol in the United States, which is much less regulated, much easier to get. You just have a normal prescription. It's used to treat stomach ulcers, so they can't really take it off the market. Um, and so we can talk more about that potential shift and how it could affect people. Um, the sort of bottom line is it's not ideal. Uh, but I think probably Rebecca will um, tell you more about some possibilities she sees there. And I think just to sum up, this is a moment of enormous transition. In a lot of ways, we don't quite know what was going to happen. Um, when I was reporting over the summer and in the fall, it felt to me like the people like uh, Dr. Gompertz, who are trying to ensure that access continues, were really had the upper hand um, for the reasons Rebecca gave. It's really hard to stop people from getting their hands on a safe and effective pill that is manufactured in America and abroad. Um, but now I see much more kind of legal obstacles from the um, from red states, from abortion opponents. And um, I think inevitably there's going to be that kind of pushback and how much success uh, people fighting for abortion restrictions have depend a lot on how much we keep, how much you all keep this issue um, uppermost in your minds, how much public awareness there is, how much um, empathy there is for people who continue to seek abortions. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Sheree, and thank you again for the Center for Public Health and Human Rights for uh, hosting this important discussion. Um, I'm really deeply honored to be here with trailblazers in the field who are, you know, working to advance access and to tell the stories of providers and, and patients who are navigating these, you know, tumultuous um, landscape. 
Um, and we know that in the past, abortion has been siloed but from both public health and from medicine. Um, and it's important that as public health workers and scholars that we, you know, take action to confront the, the challenges that we're seeing ahead of us and protect marginalized communities. Um, and as alluded um, by Dr. Gompertz and um, Emily Bazelon, we know that Roe was not enough. And prior to Roe, we saw uh, a slew of uh, abortion restrictions in a lot of states ranging from waiting period laws to gestational limit bans. Um, and trap laws regulating abortion providers and facilities that had severely limited access to uh, to uh, to care for a lot of people um, living in states with one or fewer um, abortion providers. Um, and these laws we know are burdensome, and as, as was mentioned, especially to communities who are uh, poor and marginalized. Um, and in a lot of these states, uh, the ones primarily in the South and Midwest, um, a lot of those clinics um, have closed or abortions are banned. And nearly 20 million, million women of reproductive age are living in those, um, in, the, in those states and are really forced to travel long distances to, um, to access care. Uh, we know there are, again, long-term implications for carrying an unwanted pregnancy to term, um, including um, financial burdens related to um, with related with evictions and bankrupt bankruptcies, women unable to attain educational um, opportunities that they had sought from themselves and uh, lost employment as well. And again, prior to Dobbs, we also had the Hyde Amendment in place, uh, where Medicaid um, uh, Medicaid coverage for abortions uh, was not allowed in, in states uh, with um, that uh, f federal. Um, protections for um, medica Medicaid access to abortions uh, was not allowed, further harming women who are economically um, disadvantaged. And I think I just want to highlight the reproductive justice framework that um, Dr. Schwartz brought up earlier, as it's really important for framing this discussion. Um, and this was, a, again, a framework that emerged about 30 years ago uh, from a group of, a group of black women um, who wanted to highlight the needs of women in color and other marginalized people um, and focus, um, focus on the human right for bodily autonomy. And again, to, to not have children, to have children, to parent children in, in safe and sustainable communities. And I think the RJ framework is really important in this discussion um, because it forces us to uh, look at the broader spectrum of human rights and social justice issues, including housing, healthcare, employment, and education, that also impact um, that also impact abortion access. Uh, and again, this is an opportunity for us to re-examine you know existing policies around uh, sex, pregnancy, and parenting. Um, and yes, the fall of Roe is, is devastating, uh, but then again, it really fo forces us to focus on the voices of those who are marginalized. And an it's an opportunity to build better by leveraging the technologies that were mentioned by Dr. Gompers, in including telemedicine um, and abortion pills. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, for that framing. I think it's really useful, and you all have um, you know, unique perspectives, which uh, add to the richness. So kind of building off of that, that last sentence, Sara, you know, I, I want to explore a little bit what some of the successful models for abortion care uh, have been. And particularly thinking of, you know, how abortion care has been successfully provided in more restrictive environments, whether that's globally, uh, whether that's in, in red states in America. Um, obviously, we've touched a little bit on the on the telehealth piece. But, but I would assume, um, and, and Dr. Gumpertz, correct me if I'm wrong, that even there, there's going to be some heterogeneity in terms of how easy or difficult it's been um, to provide those services. I'm wondering if you could talk, um, for starters, but, but welcome others' thoughts here too, um, about what some of the, the models that you have seen be successful in, in these more challenging environments. Um, so there, 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 there's only two models, basically, <laughs> to be honest. It's uh, telemedicine, so having the pill sent by mail to women's home address or pe people with unwanted pregnancy, or on the ground activism from women's groups that are uh, distributing abortion pills on the ground, and especially that has been uh, pioneered a lot in, uh, in Latin America and also in Eastern Europe and other places. Um, and, um, but the, the real problem here is with both the models 
is censorship and how are people that need you going to find you? So one of the things, for example, that Women on Web, which is one of the other organizations, the first telemedical or, or abortion service that was there, um, what it faced is censorship where the website was blocked in, for example, in Saudi Arabia, but also in Spain, a democratic country. Um, and, um, um, and another, or now what we see, for example, when you look for, uh, for aid access with Bing, the new, uh, uh, Microsoft uh, AI um, uh, um, browser, uh, there is a warning uh, that that you cannot trust aid access. And these are really problematic because it means that the access to the information and the services are mediated by private partners like Google, like Microsoft, like Facebook or whoever. And what we see now in also in Texas is where there is now a proposed new ban on the websites that are providing information or the pills. And we've been working against these censorship of our websites for, for, for already a long time. And the problem with women's rights groups that are distributing the abortion pills is, of course, they become very vulnerable because in most countries they are uh, criminal, they are criminal, uh, can be criminal prosecuted. And uh, only very recently an abortion rights um, activist in Poland uh, was convicted for exactly that, providing abortion pills to women. So um, it makes the whole system extremely vulnerable and underground, and that makes it really difficult to access and find the services that people need. And that, together with the enormous stigma and fear that is created by restrictive laws, um, is, is what is so um, damaging. Did I understand you correctly so that being... Positive. Bing is actually putting up a message saying that, that yeah. you, aid access can't be trusted. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, it, Emily, I don't know if you want to touch on some of those First Amendment issues that were sort of raised in terms of banning access to an internet site. I mean, is there press? I mean, what is the precedent for that being legal? Um, well, I mean, Rebecca's right that online private parties control access to information and they can set their own rules, right? So social media sites, Google, they don't have to ab abide by the very free rules we have for the First Amendment. They can make their own decisions. And um, one thing that sometimes happens is that uh, companies like that don't really relish political controversies. They can get nervous about promoting services that um, could get them into hot water. Um, and so that may be informing part of what's going on. It's also possible, you know, some of the uh, internet providers for abortion pills um, don't have the kind of telehealth framework that um, aid access uses where there's a help desk and there um, is clear backup. And so maybe aid access is getting kind of is being caught up in warnings that really have nothing to do with the services it provides. I don't know if that's what you think is happening, Rebecca. Hard to say when you're yeah, dealing with it, Google. <laughs> no, it's Bing. It's Microsoft. Oh, Bing. So sorry. Actually, we know we know what it is because it is because of the FDA letter that was sent uh, to us in uh, 2019. Got it. Uh, and that has been it's through the pharmaceutical organization. It's a whole loop. Um, but I, I don't think it really matters. The problem is that you cannot correct it. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, um, it's, it, or it's very difficult. And that is also when you're, you know, banned from Instagram, Facebook, whatever. It's, it's, there's so much censorship. And I, I, I think that, um, that, that is really when we look at what, you know, what does it mean? The, the restrictions of abortion access. Uh, that is one of the things that are, are extremely important to keep in mind. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll add one more thing and then, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't mean to. Uh, no, no, please. Well, just to take a step back, you know, really what's going on here is thinking of abortion and reproductive health care as separate from other domains of health care and having a kind of, you know, black line around it that it has to be treated differently, handled with care. When I started writing about the abortion pills in 2014, um, when I learned about Dr. Gompertz's work, you know, as a journalist, you want to really carefully look at the research about how safe and effective a set of medications is. And I was struck then, and there is so much more evidence now, 
by how really relatively safe and effective this drug is compared to lots of other um, medications that have far less scrutiny and are far less regulated in the United States. Um, there is, I think, inevitably a political element to how we think about access to these medications. And we have a lot of that research as well as the access in large part because Dr. Gompertz has partnered with um, researchers in public health in the United States. And that work is very important. But to a degree, the FDA remains, um, you know, somewhat resistant, at least to treating mifepristone as uh, a kind of prescription only drug. And obviously states that want to restrict abortion have seized on that and um, continued to end uh, up to the ante of their restrictions. So that's part of what's happening here. Can I, can I add something to this, Emily? Sorry. Yeah. I think we really have to think about the abortion pills as an over-the-counter drug. It has a much higher safety profile than many of the over-the-counter drugs that are available. Um, and so, um, and for example, um, the other way that women that need abortion pills are apprentice patients. They're not patients. They're, they are people that just need a, something to stop a pregnancy that they don't want and it's not a patient and i i think that uh that only when we start talking about mifepristone and misprostol as something that should be available in any drugstore on the request of anybody that needs it uh th this is going to be addressed yeah i, I think the way MIFI has been regulated um also speaks to kind of the history of the u.s and you know, trying to regulate sex and sexuality over, you know, um, decades. Um, and this also translates to how it's almost kind of going in the opposite direction of the trend in a lot of global settings. So we've seen a green wave in Latin America where there's a big liberalization of um, uh, ab abortion policies. And I've worked in an international context where um, we're trying to study abortion access within clinics, but people have just tremendous access in pharmacies. And that's just not something that we see here um, in the United States. And we also saw kind of the friction that it took with emergency contraception to have that be available uh, for, for people to access it. And that's just, I think that the, the, the context, the both religious and political context in the U.S. really dictates you know, the policies that are being made. And it really has kind of divided these um, these states by historical lines as well in terms of the types of policies that they've advocated for. Um, and, you know, I think it is also an opportunity to kind of look to uh, international context to see, you know, what does menstrual management look like? Part of it might be a messaging issue where, and, you know, I think with Plan B, there's uh, there's a lot of um, emergency contraception. There's a lot of misconception about oh, this is an abortion. So maybe the, you know the messaging around Plan B can also be adopted to um, you know market um, mifepristone and, and um, misoprostol in such a way that is it's part of a, a, a spectrum of um, reproductive health care where women have and people who can get pregnant have access to a wide spectrum of available options to. Um, control fertility. You know, that's a really good, really good point. And I'm, I'm glad that you, you touched on the issue of messaging, because it's something that I think a lot about. Um, I grew up in a red state. That's where all of my family is. I think a lot about how do we communicate with people that don't necessarily see the world the same way that we do, right, or that I do. And uh, it's challenging, as we all know. Um, but I'm curious to hear around this issue, what have been some strategies? And maybe, Emily, I'll start with you since you are our journalist and um, resident communicator. Um, what strategies have you found to be the most effective in, in terms of whether it's information, storytelling, it, whatever it may be to help connect with people that may have approached the issue from a slightly different perspective than yours? So for a long time as a journalist in this space, I felt resigned to the idea that um, abortion was kind of stuck in American uh, public opinion, that there are polls and they're pretty stubborn. They don't really move. And yes, more people decide, define themselves as pro-choice than as pro-life, but it wasn't really clear what they meant by that term. And it just seems like this issue had the potential to be divisive kind of forever. 
I do think that Dobbs has had an impact in that area. Americans don't like dramatic change often. And so there was this feeling that we're taking away something from people who needed it, um, especially women's lives were at stake and their health was at stake and their futures were at stake. And it is striking to see that that is starting to shift these numbers, which seemed cemented for such a long time. I think that the sense that um, there are real people being affected by these policies and it's changing the course of their lives is pretty important. Uh, one piece of research I'll just call out because it's been so crucial in this space is the Turnaway Study, which really looked at what happens to people in the long term when they try to get an abortion and they are turned away. And there are real life impacts in terms of mostly people's economic circumstances and um, their emotional well-being. Doesn't mean that people don't love and, and, and want the children that they had that they weren't planning for, but it can really affect the kind of material circumstances of their lives and the other people in their family, including the other children they have. So... I think that's an example of um, the kind of information that public health research can provide that can make a huge difference in terms of people's understanding once they know um, and open themselves to those kinds of impacts and to hearing those kinds of stories. Any other strategies, Dr. Gompertz or Sarah, that you've found effective? I find it so hard. I just don't have any patience anymore with it. Um, uh, because, you know, um, for me, the, so I have been always, I started out, oh, it's a public health issue. And then it became a human rights issue. And none of these really matter in the end, because the only thing that matters is this individual person that is there, that needs an abortion, whether whatever their position, position is. What I used to say, I am an abortion doctor. I've had so many women that came to me. Well, actually, I'm against abortion, but my situation is different. And that is so much of the fundamental of this conversation. Why do other people decide over the lives and the, of, of other people that it's so fundamentally just about them? Um, and so, um, uh, and, and of course, stories are important in that. But what I also know is that people have very little tendency to be very empathetic for people for situations that they've never been into. Uh, and that was one of the problems, for example, which we knew in Europe, where um, in the Netherlands, before it became legalized, you had a, a committee of doctors that had to decide whether or not a woman could have an abortion. And they were always voting for the women that were from their own social class to have the abortion and not the poor people. And that's because they could identify better. Um, and um, and so, yeah, I mean, um, the, the, so the strategy, I don't know. I think one of the things that we really need to stop is having making excuses. One abortion is as good as 10 abortions or 20 or 30 when an abortion is about actually somebody taking control of their own lives. And I know that many abortion rights activists, they feel very kind of um, uh, un, um, uncomfortable with these these kind of um, um, statements. Um, and I think that that the fact that 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 there's still so much nuance, even with the people that are uh, for abortion rights, it's it's uh, we have to get our act straight out there the anti-abortion people they're quite clear i mean it's an abortion no never in no circumstance so one of the things that i thought that sometimes made it difficult a little bit because of course you have these extreme groups on both sides and you want to move the middle ground that has always been the idea but i think in this world where there's constantly so much polarization i don't even know if that strategy, which has always been the strategy, still works, because it's so hard to reach the middle ground, because um, people don't read the, the neutral media anymore. They don't look at neutral media anymore. Um, and and so one of the things that that I realized that sometimes still help is to um, to make people aware. For example, most people support abortion for rape cases, for example, or incest, or with very young children. 
But the, the status of the fetus is exactly the same. It doesn't matter whether it's a fetus that is from a rape or when it's a fetus from somebody who didn't use anticonceptives because they didn't want to. Um, and to try to make people aware of the kind of the, the, the consequences of what they believe and whether it really makes sense what they believe. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and, and, and Sarah, you know, you mentioned before kind of thinking about how we market this, right? And, and you know, maybe thinking about taking some lessons from the emergency contraception space. And I guess that's something I've kind of wrestled with as well in terms of thinking about communication um, is there's, there's a lot of other adjacent issues, right? Access to contraception, emergency contraception. Um, you know, I read some articles about, you know, concerns about... Um, you know, IVF being available for individuals based on, you know, some of the when life sort of starts um, debates, you know, recognizing that women who are, you know, older and, you know, maybe more likely of means might identify more with risks around genetic testing later in pregnancy and then identifying, you know, um, later in their pregnancy that they feel like the best option for them would be an abortion, trying to find these ways for people to, to identify. And I, I struggle to, to, to land myself on whether those are all distractions or if those are ways of getting people to identify, um, you know, trying to avoid the fear mongering or the avoidance of elevating rights, but also trying to figure out what people will sort of see themselves in and, and sort of be able to show some empathy. I don't know if you have any thoughts related to that. No, I, that's, that's really hard. And I think um, going back to Dr. Gomper's comments too, it's people who are kind of on the other side don't realize kind of what that stance really means and the actual lived experiences. I was a post-abortion um, talk line counselor for over five years talking to people after they've had an abortion. And I was surprised at how many people were essentially very much anti-abortion and were protesting it. And then they were maybe in a violent situation and needed to have an abortion or they, you know, whatever the, their circumstances were, they found that it was really important for them to have an abortion. Um, and that perspective shift was very much based on their own lived experiences. So I think there is a lot of power in storytelling. Um, I think part of it is also part of the challenge in storytelling is that there's some sort of like moral compass that we're always kind of trying to gauge against of is that a sufficient justification for abortion? And I really feel like we need to move away from that kind of judgment of like what is a justified reason for, for yeah. abortion. Um, and I think this is where the human rights framework and the reproductive justice framework can help us in, in really pushing forward a new way of um, maybe focused on bodily autonomy. And I think with, with the... With the Dobbs decision, there are, we also saw other potential threats to other types of rights. And so I think coalition building and kind of leveraging those um, those uh, other other groups that are also affected by issues of, of autonomy to be able to communicate that this is about this is a human right. Um, and I always found it so interesting that. You know, you have a human right, and then the minute you become pregnant, you actually have less rights. So that is such, that's so mind-blowing to me. Um, so I think being able to communicate that from a human rights perspective really can be powerful, um, and I think is more aligned with a lot of the messaging globally as well. Well put. Um, so maybe switching gears a little bit and thinking a little bit more around this implementation. Um, many of the potential you know, vigilante laws that we've seen, um, the case in Texas. Often it's not the woman that's being targeted in terms of who would be penalized, right? Um, and, and you mentioned this, Dr. Gomper, it's, it's potentially the, you know, the provider, um, you know, the health organization uh, that could be held accountable. And there's been some debate in, in terms of, you know, how to sort of think about that from the perspective of, you know, providers, like what ethical responsibility, what moral responsibility do they have to provide services um, when they themselves might be held accountable? And, you know, I'm curious, Dr. Gompertz, how you've sort of thought about this issue for yourself, um, but also maybe just, you know, thoughts more generally from the panel uh, around, you know, the taking of personal risks and, and what can be expected and, and the focus of, of that versus, 
you know, some of the, the reasons that the providers are being targeted rather than the uh, women themselves. So, so I actually think it depends um, because in Northern Ireland, women have been prosecuted for having abortions uh, and have been uh, convicted um, in Latin America as well. Um, so it's not that women are, uh, and now uh, South Carolina just adapted a law that will also criminalize abortion. So I don't think women that are, are people that are using abortion pills uh, to end their pregnancies are uh, uh, are not criminalized. They are actually, and 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 in, and even in the UK, for example, a person that induces their own abortion, uh, it's a criminal offense. Um, and and especially people that have been in longer in pregnancy, they have been prosecuted. Um, so the risk is for everybody. Um, it it doesn't matter uh, who you are, where you are, um, and um, so. It, for me, it's an interesting question because I also think that the, the kind of the idea about risk in the US is so much um, uh, more present. Like it's such a legalized society. Uh, people can be pro prosecuted for whatever, for everything. Uh, there's uh, constantly their court cases. And uh, that's one of the reasons, for example, why um, the um, insurances to protect the mal against malpractice for doctors, I mean, it's really extremely expensive for abortion care even though it's one of the most safest medical procedures that 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 and, and one of the problem is that that is being exported more and more to other countries as well so we see an increase in uh, legal um, cases uh, here in Europe as well um, I don't know if you can protect yourself against it. You just have to go through it. I mean, I've gone through so many court cases already, so I'm kind of, okay, let's take on the next one. We'll see. The problem now is really that you cannot trust the courts to be neutral anymore and to be um, according to the rule of law, especially in the US. There is no rule of law anymore in this issue, uh, if it ever existed. But now, for sure, it doesn't. Um, and I think that makes it more... Uh, difficult uh, because you know you won't get a fair judgment and 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 that is of course the legal injustice in the US is a huge problem I mean Emily can talk more about that anyway um, and so that is different for different countries um, in Europe that is much less the case except when you talk about Poland Poland uh, and Hungary they have the same problem of legal injustice yeah so Emily do you want to add to that Sure, I'm interested in Sarah's thought too. I mean, I find this in some ways the hardest part of the conversation and the hardest thing to figure out how to write about because risk is real. It also um, sometimes used as a kind of paternalistic tool to prevent people from making choices that they want to make, um, right? So if you tell people you're at great risk for being criminalized, maybe um, you're going to basically prevent them or make them think that they shouldn't have access to care that they want and need. I worry about that a lot. Um, and one thing I have um, learned and heard from people in the reproductive justice space is that it's important to have a lot of as much autonomy it, as possible um, that, you know, people who are more subject to these kinds of criminalizing or lawsuit risks also face lots of other risks in their lives. And um, that it should be up to them how to balance those risks as much as possible. Now we're also having this conversation, as you were talking about, Shuri, in terms of providers and how much risk they should be expected to take on. And when I was writing about the telemedicine shield laws, just kind of starting out last summer and fall, some of the big mainstream um, abortion rights organizations were very nervous about getting behind these laws. Um, their kind of legal risk aversion was kicking in. Um, and they had a very different take on them than Dr. Gompertz and the independent providers that she works with, who we're much more willing to say, I understand that this isn't going to completely um, guarantee me in the kind of ironclad way that there's no risk, but I want to try to do this anyway. And that's an interesting tension in the movement um, that is going to continue to play out. It may be affecting why it's taking a while for other states, including New York, to pass these kinds of laws. 
And I don't feel like I can make a judgment about how much risk I can expect other people to take on, right? I'm not standing in the shoes of these abortion providers. Um, and I'm too old, I think, to be seeking an abortion myself. Um, so I think for me, it's a matter of trying to figure out how to present risk as real without exaggerating it in a way that creates more fear than is warranted. And that's hard. I'm not sure that we've really mastered that in the conversation about this yet. And I wonder what you think. Emily. That. Yeah, sorry. Can I, can I respond to you, Emily? I think you're, you're so right and it's so important. I think the way you can do it is by, or I don't know, I mean, you've talked about it. But yeah, yeah, you tell me, that's good. No, always. But I think it's also it's really about explaining people how they can diminish the risks. Yes. Give them the tools in their hands that they don't have to. They don't just have risks. They can, you know, they can have, without making them scared. Like, but it's yeah, it's um, um. So for example, what we do is we tell women if they need any aftercare that they can just go to a doctor and say that they had a miscarriage. Um, because in many cases, it's the, it's the emergency care doctors or other doctors that are denouncing uh, the women. That's what we've seen in other countries. Um, but of course, then there's also partners, like now what happened in Texas, where, I mean, who would have thought like this? I mean, you, 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 it's like some of these situations that are now in the media and all over and that where they, it's, it's, it's so crazy that, you know, that it's even, and that's, yeah. So you, you cannot even think about a risk, a risk like that in order to, anyway, sorry, um, Emily, go ahead. I, yeah. <laughs> sorry, uh, you go ahead. I, 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 you know, I, sometimes I just, I lose my words. It's like, I'm so flabbergasted. Like, is this actually happening? That somebody <laughs> is suing the two friends of his ex-wife who he was mal maltreating to have abortion pills. I mean, yeah, it's, mm -hmm worse than Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just briefly, I, I feel like when we were talking about criminalization, there's, um, you know, there are communities that are that fear criminalization with with or without abortion. So when you add yeah. this murkiness of what is the law? What, is, what can I do? What can I access? How much trouble would I get into? Oftentimes, there are some, some communities are that where that risk is OK and that they're willing to take it. But oftentimes, Com communities that have been marginalized and criminalized in the past feel that fear is very real. Um, and that's when I think a lot of, you know, lo you know, relying on community based organizations who essentially give access to information, access to resources, travel, funding, et cetera, is really important because that's when we kind of minimize that risk is by providing kind of that community based support. Um, and then I think just going back in terms of like provider risk versus patient risk, I think providers have had to confront this even before Roe. A lot of the state, um, you know, uh, like pre-abortion counseling laws had a lot of medically inaccurate information that providers were forced to give. It was like a speech. And this was this went directly against the type of medical care that people wanted to provide. So it was almost like this friction between what the state wants um, providers to do versus what their clinical uh, practice and training tells them to do is at, a, you know, as a, at an impasse. And so I'm really hoping that a lot of um, medical organizations also take, you know, take up space. I know ACOG and AMA have definitely been doing that um, a lot with some of their their um, their opinions. But, you know, that friction between medical care and like what what does it mean to provide accurate and um, um and timely care to a patient, and what is the law telling you? I think that needs to be that needs to be solved, and I think a lot of that that risk would be mitigated for providers too if they have protection from these larger organizations. I could ask so many more questions, um, but I want to give the audience an opportunity to to ask some questions as well. Um, Haley Thomas, uh, you get the first question because uh, you represent the Public Health Students for Reproductive Justice, a co-sponsor of, of the event, and thank you for, for your support. Great, thank you so much for... Yeah, 
Okay. Thank you so much for being here for this important conversation. Um, I do abortion research as a PhD student here at the school, and I'm also a teaching assistant for our public health perspectives on abortion class. So I would like to pose a measurement question that one student brought to our class yesterday. Um, what does this current climate mean for abortion measurement, understanding that abortion is already really difficult to measure? And then what are the implications of inaccurate or incomplete abortion reporting for each of your roles as journalist, provider, advocate, and researcher? Great question. That is a great question. Do you want to start? <laughs> Fair enough. Do you want to? I mean, you're working on that all the time. Wait, Rebecca, unmute yourself. Okay, so I think that uh, the numbers were not accurate, haven't been accurate for over years, because I think there has been a lot of, and, and there has been research that have shown that uh, many people have already, were already trying to self-manage before Roe versus Wade was overturned. Uh, with my stall, there have been some estimates. So um, uh, I think it will be more challenging now uh, to find out how, how many, especially because it's so safe. So very few people turn up in, uh, in, um, uh, with complications in hospitals. That is the normal way that it used to be measured uh, to see how many people are reporting with complications with hospitals. Um, the question is how important is it actually to know how many abortions are happening? That's the first question that, that is there, I think. I think this idea that we have to know how many abortions uh, are happening all the time, why? If we think it's a, it's a normal medical procedure uh, or that it's like, you know, uh, taking aspirin or not, perhaps not like that, but um, um, not everything is measured. Um, and and so the, the reason why the measurements have to be there. Um, still, I mean, I find it very important to do the research, but I think the research is not so much about numbers. It's really about the experiences and think what is really happening with people to navigate this landscape where abortion is so restricted, what are the fears, uh, how does it impact, you know, the the abortion experience, everything. So I think that's more important than numbers. Um, and that's why we are working with that. Um, what, what was the other question? I don't remember. No. That was good. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts? You go ahead. Just to piggyback off that point, I do think abortion measurement in general has been like through clinic surveys and there, there are certain um, ways we've been kind of documenting that. Um, but oftentimes also like that, we know that's not inaccurate, but it does help us kind of get certain trends. Um, it has also been weaponized against, you know, like this, the state has this many number of abortions. So in some states like that has been used against them. So I actually I do think it's important to, to have that information and have that data, um, even seeing like a what gestational age are people terminating their pregnancies lets us know a lot about access too. so a lot of people are being pushed to second trimester or et cetera because they're not able to access that information. Um, I think it's important to know. Um, but, but, you know, I think with self-managed abortion, there are different, you know, population type surveys that we could do to be able to kind of capture that. Um, and I think it also documents the shift in how abortion practice has been carried out. It has been very much, it went from a very hospital based practice to very much an independent kind of clinic based practice. And now we're seeing another shift towards telemedicine and self-managed abortion. So, you know, I think with, with those transitions, we are going to experience shifts and kind of not having the data catch up. Um, but I think it's important to document. And I really hope this, this second shift will be able to, um, to, you know, we will be able to be able to document that, uh, even though there are certain difficulties associated with that. I think that's a really good point about the kind of difficulty of documenting self-managed abortion and um, online telemedicine abortions and then what conclusions we draw from not knowing the answer. Um, and what exactly are we trying to figure out and what kind of cause and effect do we ascribe? So if it turns out that the number of abortions in the United States declines, but only a small amount post Dobbs, does that mean that we don't have to worry about access anymore? Does that turn into a kind of warning to red states that their restrictions aren't working, which then makes them double down on those efforts? Um, I'm not really sure what the answers to those questions are. 
I also am curious, we're now nine months out. So we're going to start to get information about the post Dobbs birth rate in various states. Um, there are lots of factors that affect the birth rate, not just access to reproductive health services. Um, and so again, I'm just not sure what conclusions that it's going to be really credible to draw from that data when we start seeing what it looks like. But um, it's hard not to be curious about numbers, even though I think you're both right that we should approach them with caution um, and be careful about what we know and don't know. I suppose building on that, are there are there particular evidence gaps that you see that that you think would, you know, if I had this piece of information, it would help me in my reporting or in my ability to advocate to, you know, um, policymakers, for example. Um, you know, we're speaking to a, a room of researchers, so people that might be interested in engaging in some of this this uh, line of work. I'll jump in. I mean, I would love to have some kind of reliable estimate of self-managed abortion and um, abortions that are being provided uh, by ordering pills online. I'm just not sure how we're going to arrive at that. Um, you know, will we end up feeling like we have some kind of rough sense going forward? Um, the aid access numbers have been precise and the best numbers we've had so far, but they're necessarily incomplete because that's not the only way to order abortion pills. Um, so they're really important, uh, but they're not going to fill in the whole picture. And I don't know if going forward it will really be possible to have a kind of um, estimate that we rely on for the United States or whether it's going to differ so much where you are. But I would like to know <laughs> if I thought it was correct. No, but, 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 but how is it going to? So the question is, I think that's true, is of course, I mean, it's nice to know, but indeed, how is it going to impact? Like, what do we really need to make the point for policymakers, for lawyers, for where, where is it going to matter how much it is actually really um, precisely is um, instead of is the trend knowing the trends enough, do you think? I suppose one could argue that by having a denominator, then you also can look at the numerator in terms of safety. Um, helping to make the case for the safety. I, I don't know, that's, that's yeah. one possibility. Yeah, but the safety is being proven already. I think the safe managed, self managed abortion safety, effectivity, it's, it's been researched. You know, the pills are the same. Uh, it doesn't make, make a difference on. We already I, know. Yeah, I agree, but one might argue that, you know, um, the sort of over encroachment of women's autonomy, sort of, you know, the having more safety data that that indicate that women can self manage their own care rather than having it provider managed might be useful. Obviously, I think, you know, you, you all have, you know, your data support that um, immensely. Um, but I think maybe it's been an area with less data available in the US. Or less awareness. Yeah. less awareness. I mean, I think one thing we less still awareness. don't have is like broad public awareness about abortion pills. Like every time I write about them, I still have to tell everyone how they work and what they do and what they are. And when you talk about surgical abortions, you can assume that knowledge. Um, even though medication abortions now account for more than half of the abortions in the U.S., I still feel as a journalist, like I have that obligation to inform because it's not clear to everyone. I will be happy when we get over that information hump because it just kind of clunk gunks up my stories. <laughs> yes. All right, we are just about at time. Is there one last question in the audience? Hi, thank you so much for being here and speaking to us. I was wondering if there's any anecdotally or like preliminary data on how provider prescribing behavior for birth control has changed after Roe v. Wade? No. It's a but great I question. Think, I have no idea. Yes, I think so. But I also think, I think there is a mistake. And that is that the use of birth control is not at all related to the abortion rate. Uh, emergency contraceptives are also not. Um, and so, um, um, and because there are many, except for that the same reasons why people don't use contraceptives might be the reasons why they need an abortion. And that is, for example, that they can't afford 
to use them. I guess I was wondering like a little bit about like the socioeconomic bias that providers have to prescribe birth control and if the decision affected that in any way. Yeah, I don't think we know. I haven't seen any surveys of, of that just yet. Um, I've worked on, on a study that was looking at um, prescribing patterns and like referral patterns for a uh, nationally representative sample of OBGYNs. And, you know, surprisingly, not a lot of them provide even like post-abortion um, contraceptive care because I think people still have, even after an abortion, they will still have similar concerns about why they're not using contraception or, um, so there, I think, I think it varies. I'm, I'm, and I'm not sure if, you know, oftentimes we expect that when something like this, like Dobbs or, you know, a, a state law goes into effect changing access to abortion care that directly translates to behaviors, whether it's for the provider or for the patient. And I'm, I don't think that actually happens that, that quickly. Um, but it would be interesting to see for sure. As we close up, any, any final uplifting thoughts from the panelists? Rebecca, you started with saying silver lining. <laughs> Well, I, the, the silver lining is there are abortion pills and uh, the, the people that have an unwanted pregnancy will find, uh, as long as there's no censorship on the internet, they will find it, they will find access to the pills, they will be everywhere, it's like marijuana or whatever, it will be there. It's just, uh, yeah. And that's great. I mean, you're not dependent anymore on somebody putting things in your uterus to end your pregnancy. And I mean, that is amazing. It's really so revolutionary that people can just do their own abortion safely. Um, and um, yeah, that's the only uplifting thing I have. I think my note of uh, hope is that we've seen these forces clash many times in history, right? Where you have people who want to control other people's autonomy, often women's autonomy and their bodies and their sexuality. And there are these like powerful, um, often but not always uh, male led forces that try to shut down people's lives and take away their choices. And then there are other people who rise up and resist and they are fearless about doing that. Um, and that kind of energy is part of the reproductive rights and justice movement right now in a way that is really interesting um, to watch for me as a journalist. Um, change can be bad, but it also um, brings out unexpected things in people sometimes. And so that is a part of the kind of next stage and next chapter of this in the United States and abroad that I'm, I'm really curious about. Yes, to, to echo th those points, I do feel like, um, you know, Dobbs highlighted a lot of the, the challenges that were happening before Dobbs, quite honestly. In a lot of states, this was like re abortion restrictions were so frequent. And from, you know, having to wait 72 hours versus, you know, having to come back, you know, all, there's so many restrictions that were in place um, that. Dobbs kind, of, Dobbs kind of stripped down those um, kind of illusions because a lot of the public wasn't aware that those were actually restrictions that were in place. And so I feel like there are a lot more people engaged in the conversation. I feel like it has mobilized a lot of communities to um, find resources outside of um, state legislators, le le legislators and did a lot of collaborations between um, researchers, providers, uh, community members to find new ways forward. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to really build better. And maybe, you know, I think we didn't have Mifepristone and misoprostol during, uh, in 1973, but the landscape of abortion care, the technologies that we have available to us have shifted. And it, it is also an opportunity for us to shift how care is provided um, and, you know, giving it that, you know, that power back to communities and people so that they're able to manage their um, bodily autonomy, their families, et cetera. Well, thank you all for being fearless and for being change makers. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Bye, Rebecca. Bye. Thank you, everybody. That's so nice to see you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye.